Welcome everyone. Thank you for coming out tonight. Hear these words that call us into a time of worship. Can one night make a difference? Can one star outshine all others? Can one child shake up the world? Yes, a thousand times yes. Was ever there such a night when stars shone bright, when angels formed a heavenly chorus and shepherds quaked? Was ever there such a birth when a baby's cry meant that God is now here? Was ever there a moment like now when we let the majesty and simplicity of the story touch our hearts? When we draw closer to family and God, when we sing with deep feeling and overflowing joy, oh, this is the night, this is the night. Oh, that our tongues were like bells to ring out the joy and that our hands were like drums to sound out the beat of new life. Oh, that our voices sounded like the heavenly choir and that our hearts could hold the wonder of it all. Oh, that our knees were strong enough to kneel forever in awe and that our eyes could open wide enough to see glory shining in every star and in every person. May it be so for all of us. Let's stand and sing Angels We Have Heard on High.
together in prayer. Oh God of love, you have brought us together tonight and blessed us with your very self. Open our eyes to the light of Christ which glows the darkness of a world engulfed in apathy, pain, and loss, a world separated from you. Speak to us now that we may hear the good news of your salvation. Bring us into the wonder of your presence. Fill us with that light and carry it out with us into our lives. Amen. Our first scripture lesson tonight comes to us from Luke's Gospel in the first chapter. It's the part of the story where the angel comes to Mary. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be since I'm a virgin? The angel said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy. He will be called the Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth, is in, in her old age, has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month for her who was said to be barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. And then Mary said, Here I am, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. And then the angel departed from her. Our next scripture comes to us from Matthew's gospel. And this is Joseph's side of the story when the angel came to him. Now the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins." All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took her as his wife, but had no marital relations with her until she had born a son, and he named him Jesus. Time for the kids and um, so since we don't have any little kids with us this evening um, we're still going to read the story um, and uh, talk about it so you guys are all going to be kids for a few minutes and I know you hate that mm -hmm. we're going to skip that mm -hmm. um, first we'll put the baby Jesus in his place and uh, the book I have for this evening is called have you seen Christmas? And Christmas is, um, first of all, not what you think it is. And uh, I know I've read this book before in other years, but um, um, I think it's a good one. It's by um, Vicki Howie, H-O-W-I-E. Christmas Eve dawned cold and gray over the city. A bitter wind shook the Christmas lights that were hung across High Street and sent paper cups rolling along the sidewalk. It swirled snow like white confetti around the steeples of city churches, and it picked up newspapers and flattened them against colorful shop windows. In the sheltered doorway of a department store, a small, scruffy dog named Christmas sniffed the cold air with interest and went in search of something to eat. The dog left his young master fast asleep, huddled inside his sleeping bag, and there he stayed until the first shoppers disturbed him, and he awoke to find his only companion gone. Just around the corner, Benny and Mia were enjoying the Christmas holidays, playing hide-and-seek 
around their parents' fruit and vegetable stall. Apples, cranberries, oranges, and grapes glistened with wet snow under the striped awning. Come out, I can see you, shouted Benny. Mia's hat bobbed up from behind the box of oranges. Hey, Dad, she cried, why do you need so many oranges? You'll see, he replied mysteriously. Now, why don't you two get out from under my feet? It's going to be a busy day. Go and find your friend Luke. I think I saw him in a doorway by the bus stop. Okay, said Benny. Then we can see Christmas, his funny little dog. I love that dog. Benny and Mia set off toward the main road. They waved to Jamie, who was just coming out of the church hall. Why does Luke live on the street, asked Mia. Doesn't he have a home like us? No, Luke is homeless. It's very sad, explained Benny. He came to the city hoping to find a job, but it was more difficult than he thought. At least he has his dog, said Mia, and Benny nodded. Luke got him to, at the animal rescue center. Someone brought him, bought him for Christmas and then couldn't take care of him. I wish he was my dog, said Mia. He's the friendliest dog in the world. Rounding the corner, Benny and Mia saw Luke. He was slouched against a shop window, holding his head in his hands. What's the matter, Luke? Luke turned his pale face toward them. It's my dog, he, ex he explained. Christmas is missing. He's never left my side before now. Oh, no, the children star, um, stared at one another in dismay. Why don't we look for him, suggested Mia, and Luke shook his head. He might come back where, when I'm out looking for him. Don't worry, Luke, said Benny. We'll go and look for your dog. We'll bring him back. You just wait and see. Benny and Mia began to run along the sidewalk and almost collided with a lady coming out of the department store. She dropped several bags and bent to pick them up. Sorry, exclaimed Mia, but we're looking for Christmas. Have you seen Christmas? Have I seen Christmas, repeated the lady. I should think so. Christmas is in there. And she pointed into the busy store. Oh, thank you, chorused the children. They went in through the heavy glass doors and found themselves among counter displays of handbags and scarves and gloves. I can't see Christmas, said Benny, bending down and looking between the feet of all the shoppers. Perhaps he's gone up to the toy department. At the top of the escalator, the children pushed their way through crowds gathered around their favorite toys. Two children were arguing over a robot. I saw it first, said one, pulling at the legs. Dad said I could have it, yelled the other, tugging at his head. Put it back, both of you, ordered their father, his face bright red with annoyance. Come on, Mia, said Benny, taking her hand. Christmas obviously isn't here. Let's go back outside. A security guard was standing in the shop doorway. Excuse me, said Benny boldly. We're looking for Christmas. Have you seen Christmas? Well now, said the man, scratching his head. Have you been down to the city square? I'd say Christmas is there. The children ran all along the sidewalk. The warm breath hung in the air like tiny snow clouds. Turning the corner into the square, they gasped at the sight of a tall Christmas tree lit with hundreds of Christmas lights. Underneath it, children skated on a gleaming ice rink. They whirled and twirled, cross crisscrossing the ice as dance music pl um, blared from a loudspeaker. Wow, that's beautiful, said Mia, her eyes sparkling. But I still can't see Christmas, said Benny, and we'll have to go back soon. Luke will be waiting for us. They retraced their steps along the crowded sidewalk, wondering what they would say to Luke. Above their heads, the star decorations on the lamppost flickered and burst into light. When they were nearly back to Luke's doorway, they saw Jamie had stopped to talk to him. Jamie, cried the children running up to him. We've been looking and looking, but we can't find Christmas anywhere. I see, said Jamie gravely. So Christmas has gone missing? Well, I think I might know where we could find Christmas. Come with me. Luke got to his feet and followed the puzzled children into the adjoining street and down the steps that led to the hall under the church. As they opened the door, light and warmth flooded out and a delicious smell of hot sausages wafted under their noses. Men and women of all ages, dressed in old coats and jumpers and shawls, sat at a long table decorated with bowls of oranges. They were eating steaming plates of food served by a team of church helpers. And under the table... His ears pricked up and his tail thumping the floor sat a small scruffy dog, a sausage poking out of the corner of his mouth. There's Christmas, shouted Luke, running in out of the cold to give him a hug. Jamie was right. Later, Jamie lit the candles and invited everyone to crowd around a beautiful nativity set. 
At the first Christmas began, Jamie, there was nowhere for Mary and Joseph to stay in Bethlehem. They were homeless. The streets were bustling full of people who had traveled there for the census. No one had time for them. There was no room for them in the inn, but Jesus was born in a stable because the innkeeper tried to help them. Please stay now as long as you like. There will be hot drinks for everyone, and Christmas lunch will be provided tomorrow. And people started to clean up. Come home with us for Christmas, Benny said to Luke. I know Dad wouldn't mind, and there's always enough vegetables to eat. Oh, yes, said Mia. Then Christmas can come to our house, too. Luke walked with them in silence through the falling snow. I found Christmas today, he said after a while. I was cold and hungry and miserable, but the people in the church gave me dry, warm clothes and hot food to eat. I lost my dog and had nowhere to go, but you helped me find him and are letting me come home with you. You've all made me feel that someone cares about me. We're all, we were all looking for Christmas, but it's right here. Benny thought about the store full of people and the children arguing over the to toys. Mia thought about the snowy scene and the tree with all the lights. Luke was right. And Christmas, the small scruffy dog who liked sausages, barked and wagged his tail. So they found Christmas after all. And now if we can all join in together in prayer. The rest of the story comes to us from the second chapter of Luke's Gospel. In those days, a decree went out from Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. And this was the first registration and was taken while Quinarius was governor of Syria. All went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to the city of David called Bethlehem because he was descended from the house and family of David. He went to be registered with Mary, to whom he was engaged and who was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. Let's uh, stand and sing, O Little Town of Bethlehem. Mm -hmm. And in that region, there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flocks by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid, 
For see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace among those whom he favors. And when the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go now to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. So they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in the manger. And when they saw this, they made known what had been told them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured all these words and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen, as it had been told them. Here ends the reading of our scripture for tonight. May God add understanding to all of us. Years ago, about a week before Christmas, a friend of mine called. She was a Roman Catholic laywoman who happened to have her master's in religious education. And she told me about these a uh, few good sermon ideas that she had heard recently, and we had this nice little chat. And then I said, well, Jen, if you call me the week before Christmas, you're supposed to give me a Christmas sermon idea as well. And she said, why is that? And I said, well, I need something new and fresh and exciting to say. I need some ideas. And she said, no, you don't. You don't need to say anything new and fresh and exciting. The story says it all. It's still a miracle, no matter what you say. I think of that conversation nearly every Christmas time. We don't need anything new. The story is enough. The Christmas story is enough. We can't improve upon it. We can't gussy it up. We can't make it more or better than in any way. I'm not the only preacher to confront this each year. I read the story from a preacher who said that she reflected back on all of her Christmas sermons over the years, and she figured that they fed into one of three categories. One is don't be the innkeeper. When the love of God comes and knocks at your front door, don't say there's no room at the inn. And the second was don't limit Christmas to one day a year or even to one season a year. Now make Christmas a year-round affair. Let Jesus be born again and again and again. And the third sermon theme she said she had was, don't extinguish the light. Christmas is about the light of Christ coming into the world. Each of us makes the choice to let, that light of, let the light of God's love burn brightly within us for the year, or we choose to put out the flame. She said that was it. All the Christmas sermons she had ever preached pretty much fell under one of those three categories. She said nothing changes, and there is nothing new to say. But like my friend, she discovered for herself that that was the point. The story doesn't change no matter what, and that means that there is hope for all of us. 2,000 years ago, God looked down into a broken world, and despite the mess that people had made of it, God loved them anyway. And on this night, we celebrate that love coming into the world, not as a mighty warrior or conquering army, but as this helpless little baby, this new life that would change everything. If we were to go back to those three don'ts, I think we could add a few do's to our list, actually. Don't be the innkeeper, shutting God's love out. Instead, open the door of your heart wide and recognize that there is room in the inn. There is always more room for everyone, for all of God's children. Room for those who are different than we are. Room for those who are struggling. And don't let the joy and kindness of Christmas be a once a year event. Instead, know how we treat one another on March 25th or July 25th or October 25th says a whole lot more about how well we really keep Christmas than just how we behave on December 25th. And finally, don't extinguish the light that you've been given. Instead, tend it, fuel it. Let it burn so brightly within you that others can see it and find hope in it. 
because we all know the world needs a little light and a little hope right now. It's been a tough year. And we were all set for this winter, this Christmas, to be different than last year, but instead we're still in the midst of this darned pandemic. It's still scary, and we're not sure what's going to happen next. So it's lonely and full of anxiety. But doesn't that remind you of the first Christmas? The story doesn't change, and the birth of Jesus can still give us hope for the future ahead of us, for a better future ahead of us. So my prayer for all of you, my prayer for the world this Christmas is that Christ's light will shine brightly in all of us in this coming year so that this world is a little better for it by next Christmas. See, to be a Christian, to believe that something special happened on this night is to choose to live in hope and to pass on that hope to all those who need it most. I believe in hope because I believe that God loved us 2,000 years ago on a night in Bethlehem, and I believe that God loves us still. So yes, there's nothing new in the story, and there doesn't have to be. The story hasn't gotten old yet, and the words still apply to all of us each and every day. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. O oh, holy God, wonderful counselor, prince of peace, help us to shine your light every day. Make us, help us to make this a better world, starting in our own homes and our churches and our communities. In the name of the one born again tonight, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, we pray. Amen. O oh, holy night. O oh, holy night, the stars were brightly shining. It is the night of our dear Savior's birth. Long lay the world in sin and terror pining till he appeared and the soul felt its worth. The thrill of hope, the weary world rejoices for yonder breaks a new and glorious morn. Fall on your knees, oh, hear the angel voices, oh, night divine, oh, night, when Christ was born, oh, As we light the Christ candle, we remember that long ago, God's promise to us was kept. We called on the Lord for salvation, and not only did the Lord bring it, the Lord our God appeared to us as a baby. A baby to be loved and nurtured in the, a human family. A baby Messiah that would grow up to preach the good news that we are all welcome and loved in the kingdom of God. Today, we welcome Jesus Christ. We welcome, welcome to you, Lord Jesus. May this light remind us of the hope, peace, love, and joy that can be found in you. Tonight is the night for which we have been waiting. The Advent wreath is completed with the Christ candle in the center. And with the birth of Christ in our lives, with the birth of Christ, our lives are centered, focused, and turned toward God. 
We light this candle because Christ is the center of our lives. pray. This is the night, O oh God, the night we have waited and prepared for. When Jesus was born, you blessed this world with light and joy and gladness. You had done that from the beginning, but people didn't notice. And you still do that, even when we don't notice. That baby, that Savior, is God with us every moment of every day. So tonight, even if it's for a short while, we feel your presence coming to us as an infant. May our lives be the manger where the Christ child comes, the once empty place now filled with love. Like the lowly shepherds, we have experienced difficult days this year, but you surprise us. Like frightened parents, we don't know what to expect next. 
tonight, this story from long ago gets real for us. And while we're still battling this pandemic and so many are struggling financially or with their health or with the anxiety that has become so prevalent or with the injustice that crippled us, we also know that this one small child bridges the barriers between you, O God, and us. He is the one who taught and healed, who raised people from the dead, who turned the ones in power on their ears and traded in his swaddling clothes for a crown of thorns. He barely lived 33 years on this earth, and yet he is still alive, being born in us again in our mangers in this year of struggle. He is alive every day in first responders and frontline workers, in nurses and doctors, in vaccines and new medications to combat this virus, in grieving hearts, in every pair of eyes in every voice, in every heart, if we let him. Christ among us, Christ within us, Christ before us. As we blow our candles out, may your spirit be blown into us as we step into an unknown future. May we become your light in this fractured world. May we take your light into the world tonight and always. As we turn another year, we remember that you are always God with us. Lord, give us hope, give us love, give us peace, give us you. In the name of the one born in Bethlehem, we pray. Amen. If someone wants to get the lights in the back, that would be great. And now, my friends, may God's blessing, um, may God's presence be with you. May God's love be within you. May God's light shine through you this holy night and always. Go in peace, my friends. Go in God's amazing love. Amen. Amen.